Main Street. It was a special place for everyone, a place where you belonged. But a lot of changes have happened on Main Street, and the memory we all cherish is no match for the reality of today. All of us share a feeling that something has been lost. And in many towns, business people are working together for a better understanding of their common problems. One of the things that has to come out of all these meetings is a recommendation to wholeheartedly go after the types of stores that do belong in downtown. How do you contact these people? In other words, uh, I haven't got time to do it. John and Fred don't have time to do it. Somebody's got to do it. You can take care of your own, but try and deal with third generation estate people who have no interest in Galesburg. This is a real headache. As we examine these problems, you'll meet Chicago real estate counselor, Jared Schlaes, Washington development consultant, John Sauer, South Dakota businessman, Eddie Clay, and Norman Mintz, restoration director in Corning, New York. You'll also meet a number of Main Street business people from around the country who live with the problems of downtown every day. As a matter of fact, most downtowns are suffering. Something's gone wrong, and people are wondering what's to become of Main Street. If the question is whatever happened to Main Street, the answer is a lot of it's right here in shopping centers of this type. And there's nothing dull and boring about this kind of shopping center for most people. In fact, people congregate here looking for excitement. The developers consciously seek to create it with sculpture, with vertical movement, with falling water, and with the color and vitality of the stores themselves. Many people say that it has become Main Street. In many towns, the new focus is certainly the mall. However, there are things that Main Street has done, is doing, and can do that this mall can never do. Main Street is organic. It didn't just pop into place one day full grown. It grew one piece at a time to reflect the special character of the town. That's not true of the shopping center. The shopping center reflects the merchant's needs and the developer's needs and the fashions of the day. There is no way a center like this can evolve in the same way Main Street can evolve and in that way reflect all the realities of life so that after a certain number of years this center however good will be badly dated and it will always reflect at least to some extent this moment in history rather than the continuity of history that a good downtown reflects. The first thing is to understand how a suburban shopping center works and then to begin to help the Main Street or the uh, the older business districts to uh, duplicate as much of those organizational strengths as possible. In fact, once you start with that concept, you see that there are some strengths that Main Street has in terms of physical charm and central location and diversity and often uh, more economical uh, rent rates that uh, if you combine their existing advantages with the organizational strengths that can build into them, you can have a successful Main Street revitalization. Part of Main Street's problem is a success problem. Grandpa came to town, maybe with a pack on his back, and he opened a store, and he passed it on to his son, and the store grew and grew in volume, and Grandpa and his son grew in prosperity, and they paid off those original mortgages, and they paid off maybe the house mortgage. They're reasonably content with where they are. They are not strivers anymore. In contrast, the tenant in the regional shopping mall has such a heavy cost to pay to open his store, get in business, and stay in business, that he has to be alert, he has to be competitive, he has to be aggressive, and he is. He's constantly aware of changes in his industry. He's constantly trying to have merchandise that's right. He's pushing and advertising to make his merchandise move so that he can pay that heavy cost. Meanwhile, back on Main Street, much too often, the fixtures are 40 years old. The merchandise is not moved out periodically with aggressive sales, and so gradually Main Street falls behind. Many store owners are so accustomed to this kind of merchandising that they don't realize how uninviting it is. But a shopper's first impression of Main Street comes from its window displays. It really isn't difficult to make an attractive store window. Simplicity, clarity, and attention to customers' tastes create a much more inviting image than simply trying to display as much merchandise as possible. An even bigger problem is getting store owners to work together toward joint promotion 
and uniform hours. This is where the malls have a real advantage. One problem we have as individual merchants is to, is to get everybody together time-wise, store hours, people are independent and we just can't get everybody together on the same time schedule. In a mall, you're told when you'll be open, and you are open then. Store hours, evening shopping, these are the things merchants talk about over morning coffee. Well, you know, you wouldn't expect Thursday night to be a success at the beginning of opening up on that basis again, because you've got to show through consistent, you know, just staying with it over a period, maybe a long period of time, before you really get that thing really building up to the point where people know that it is possible to go downtown, even during a football game or something else, and get something that they want. My title business, if I stay open Thursday nights for a year, I probably wouldn't have one or two people come in. But if I leave my place closed and there's a blank, dark hole there next to Ray's nicely lit window, it's a negative. I think that you have to have the people are thinking in terms of supporting the community because my business depends on other merchants making money. They can't buy and sell property if they're not making anything. So it's a, a very vested interest for me to see that it's working too. But I will not be making any money that Thursday evening per se. I don't think we can look at them until we make money that Thursday night. Cooperation is possible on many issues. But there's one subject no one agrees on. Parking. Here stands the last bastion of the beleaguered Main Street merchant. It's the parking meter. Its purpose is not primarily to collect money for the town, but to cause customers who drive up to move on after a while so there's room for another customer later. But this parking meter and its cousins, the metered parking lot and the validation parking system, have caused more confusion and trouble among merchants than any other device. Parking meters are a nuisance. Get them out of here. We don't need parking meters. The minute somebody does something about it, I feel that uh, it'll be a boom town again. But it seems like in the downtown area, they want to park right where they want to go. If they want to go to that drugstore over there, they want to park in front of it. They don't seem to want to walk. I think if you have the merchandise that they want, and you have the friendliness that they love, they're going to walk a city block or two city blocks to get to the store anyway. I think it's exaggerated. If we talk less about parking, then I think that we would get further. In other words, I think it's a it's a low priority item compared to many of the things we uh, have to deal with in the downtown area. A higher priority is building on the assets of downtown, such as the opportunity for personal service. This town prides itself in the personal service. Now, it didn't start today, it didn't start yesterday, but started years ago. When we bought this store four years ago, we found a file put together by the Cronin family that contains every person in the community, every woman in the community. And in that file, it was her name and address, the size that she had, her color preference, her brand preference, what she bought the last time, and that was on the file. Even today, we use that, in some cases, to highlight what our personal service is all about. We had a customer the other day who came in and said, isn't it nice to walk into a store and know that a sales clerk can tell you what your grandchildren's sizes are? And so these are the things that, that are assets in a small community, and you have to use them, because if you don't use them, then you become just another retailer battling the big fellows in the big communities. And it's the small little things we do here in the community that are great. As we lose contact with one another and our institutions grow and become steadily less personal, Main Street offers an opportunity to come back together in a familiar setting and be with one another. That's just as important as the commercial revitalization of the street. In order to make Main Street a pleasant place to be, towns have tried a variety of improvement programs. These range from the simple and less expensive to more elaborate and costly solutions. Some are successful in such functions as separating traffic from pedestrian activity. Others are poorly designed, and the result is a waste of taxpayers' money. Often, sincere efforts to make downtown a pleasant place fail simply through lack of maintenance. 
Towns forget that a maintenance program must be included in any improvement plan from the very beginning, whether it's plantings or trash. I've been asked by a lot of city officials and also by merchants and uh, financial people, well, why doesn't the private sector do it? Or I've, on the other side, I've been asked, well, why can't the government do it? And I think the thing that we're learning that's very important is that successful Main Street revitalization requires the cooperation or the partnership of both the public and the private sector. Now, it's certainly not a charity effort. If you think about it logically, successful revitalization will mean more business for the retail merchants. It'll mean more loans and, uh, and deposits uh, for the financial institutions. And it means a healthier uh, community with uh, more tax revenues and a better image for the, uh, the local government. So that's, uh, uh, that's everybody profiting, and that's, uh, that's the American way. While public money can be helpful, its impact is often just the opposite. Whole towns have disappeared in the name of redevelopment. Others are hidden behind expensive and purely cosmetic amenities in an attempt to transform Main Street into a suburban shopping mall. Seeking a unified theme, many towns turn themselves into Disneylands by going medieval, Wild West, Bavarian, Barbershop Victorian, or Continental, with a prefabricated past. But by far the most popular theme is Colonial. A lot of people have the idea that preservation involves creating something like an instant Williamsburg where all the buildings resemble each other and where an attempt is made to catch one historical moment or one historical style. But you can see if you look at the actual main streets of America that they didn't happen that way. They grew up over a period of time and they grew up offering a tremendous range of architectural styles. That variety can be capitalized upon with intelligent tastes and a very few dollars to build something that is authentic and that does mean something to people and will work commercially. Instead of taking advantage of this architectural diversity, many merchants spend a lot of money covering it up, as if the problems of downtown could be solved in a new suit of clothes. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's a building underneath that white material, and quite a beautiful building, as a matter of fact. It's a beautiful brick and terracotta structure, three stories tall, and uh, we are making plans now to remove the white material and reveal the original structure. Even the windows that are such a prominent uh, part of this building were covered over. It was basically a white a glass cube that was really uh, rather dull to look at and rather unexciting. And so through a, a, a matching grant from the state and through some cooperation with the uh, with the owner we were able to remove the panels and uh, well the results are, are very evident beforehand we realized that there was some damage that was done in the process and so uh, the building will be rehabilitated the cornice uh, will be rebuilt the bricks will be repointed and replaced where necessary as well as the window sills and the building of course will be cleaned uh, you must realize that 15 years ago when the panels were were put up uh, this represented the the thinking of the day very progressive thinking, people were very proud of it, and yet uh, today, seeing what's happened, they've rediscovered their values and really uh, kind of uh, can't believe that they were involved and actually supported uh, that whole idea of covering up uh, their heritage. You might reasonably ask how Main Street got into this physical condition, how it got these patchwork remodelings and signs and storefronts and things that happened over the years. One of the reasons is that very few towns have the resources, just the plain design resources, to do the job right. And people don't know how to get it done. 
the logical solution to a storefront problem is to call in the local contractor and say, Joe, please install a storefront for me. I want one something like Sam's down the street. You, you seldom get a design job that reflects either architectural quality or the character of the town. A relatively few dollars for design can avoid a lot of waste money in the actual construction and can produce a much better result than can be hoped for by the old methods. The Glass Menagerie is a really exciting project for us. The original building uh, was built in 1880, and in the early 20s, the storefront and the facade that you see now uh, actually was placed over the original Victorian facade. This is a very valid change that was made, so we're looking to keep that. But then in the 60s, the idea of modernization and being progressive uh, came about, and so many of the beautiful details were covered over. And it was put on, it's got to be able to come off. And in most cases, it, it was put on in a very easy way, uh, cheapest way possible, easiest way possible. And so uh, well, we had found some, uh, some screws here. Here, take a look. Look at that wonderful terracotta egg and dart molding. Just beautiful. Just classic design. And look at that. That, that was covered over uh, for the sake of putting this uh, characterless, uh, shiny material. This egg and dart molding goes all the way up the building. You can see it. Um, look way up to the top of the second story, all the way across, and then down. It, it, it creates this very, very nice stage effect to the storefront, so it's as easy as that. That was actually the first step, and now we're getting involved in the cleaning of the building. A relatively easy operation, it's just basically dirt, it hasn't been cleaned in many years, and just through a mild detergent, the results can be uh, instantaneous, and again, very inexpensive. The actual carpentry is underway now also. That's uh, the biggest part of the job, of course. A lot of it is being done outside in the carpenter shop so that uh, it's a question of just fabricating it and bringing it in. I certainly like to think that the glass menagerie is, is an example of good storefront design. And, uh, well, good design is, is a combination of many factors. Through a uh, a careful look at the building, understanding about proportion, uh, looking and understanding uh, detail, um, appreciating good material, uh, like here, a uh, classic example of, of good quality craftsmanship and what good detail is all about. Being able to appreciate that and using it within the design process just means an understanding and a caring about how your storefront reflects, again, what's sold within and how you relate to the rest of the street. One of the interesting things about Main Street is how its storefronts reflect the evolution of the town. During the 1930s and 40s, many prosperous merchants remodeled with Carrara glass. Designers used this high quality material to create some of the finest commercial facades of the period. Today, many Carrara glass fronts are removed when they become damaged and difficult to repair. A greater number are threatened by failure to recognize the important contribution they make to the town. Fine design should not be sacrificed in a misguided restoration program. In this case, the town lost a whole chapter of its past, which is not equaled in quality by its replacement. While remodeling is handled on an individual basis, the whole community becomes involved when an important building is threatened. Ashland, Ohio Bank President Harvey Young some folks thought that uh, the bank building, which was built in 1873, was a uh, historical landmark in the community. I uh, question uh, really that it was a historical landmark. There are many other buildings uh, in the area that probably have more history connected to them uh, than this building. We happen to think that uh, this area did not, uh, did not lend itself to preservation. Therefore, we, we made the decision that we would raise the building, build a new building, open up the area, give it, a, give it some uh, breathing room, so to speak, and try to encourage other people, not necessarily to demolish their buildings, but to try to breathe new life into the downtown. I don't think there's another building in downtown Ashland that can take its place and can play up the architecture and the features of the other buildings as well as, as this building has. They're going to put a little parking lot, a row of parking park cars, and a park area in it. And they tell us that that'll be a beautiful downtown square, and it'll be kind of the center of Ashland. But I would rather have a tall, attractive building 
as a center than a little line of parked cars and some trees and brick walks and benches. I guess it depends on your point of view. The impact uh, upon the downtown area with this type of an investment is very difficult to measure. We do know that we have taken out uh, seven very unsightly uh, buildings and have, uh, in effect, uh, made an urban renewal of the center of downtown Ashland at no cost to the taxpayers. We uh, wanted to develop uh, the theme of a town square, and obviously uh, the room did not uh, lend itself to that, but we do have in this little park uh, what you might call half of a town square. So strange that Americans can't wait to go to Europe to see what Europeans have prized and saved and taken for granted, and yet they're so quick to destroy it here. And after it's gone, then they say, oh, why did we allow this to happen? Uh, this was our town, and uh, these were our roots, and this is what was dear to us. We are still convinced that we have perhaps put down new roots for future generations to discuss and decide as to what they shall do with this area in a hundred years. Once down, old buildings are gone forever. But many times alternatives can be found, such as adding to the older structure. The trick is to make the addition compatible with the original building. Although change is inevitable, these details do maintain a continuity with the past. Some towns even require architectural compatibility through local ordinance. I think that's where we really have to be firm about it, is when we have outside people who are coming in, whether they're architects or planners or what. Fine, let them expose us to their ideas because they've had a broader background from that. But we have to see that they use their intelligence and abilities to fit the community. Well, we're fortunate, aren't we, Eddie, that we have a historic district. We have something like 60 buildings that they just flavor and, and set the, you know, the stage, so to speak, for the whole town. What it really does is prevent somebody coming in and destroying a building uh, merely because he doesn't understand his background. And we're not saying that you can't change a building, we're not saying you can't improve it, but in Main Street in that historical district, if you are, you're going to maintain the integrity of that building so that it fits the personality of Main Street. You're not going to have a sore thumb sticking out there. And, uh, uh, this is where we have trouble uh, in a small town. We're independent, we want, damn it, we own the building and it's ours. We ought to be able to do what we want to. And it's a, it's a selling job to make the guy realize that it's to his advantage to play the game. So many people think of it as a restrictive factor. And when in essence, when we really don't analyze it, it's, it's a protective factor. There's nothing Protect restrictive everybody. about an ordinance at all. I think it's a very protective factor. In earlier times, when outsiders brought their business to town, they did it with respect for the building fabric and the scale of the street. Even national companies were careful to fit their image within the framework of local architecture. These days, poorly designed signs readily available from distributors of national products pay no attention to local traditions and overwhelm Main Street. They present a confusing image and detract from the inherent quality of the street. Local merchants don't have to accept mass-produced signs. When pushed, even the big guys can come up with appropriate design. The thing to remember is that good signs like these, in all their varieties, add to the visual richness of downtown and must be preserved. A lot of people consider old buildings a problem. I personally think they're an asset. Uh, my friend Ray Kennedy down here purchased an old building built in 1890, really dilapidated on the inside. He put enough money in it to remodel it, insulate it, and now he has one of the finest clothing stores in the area. But you back across the street and look at Ray's building, it's an 1890 structure. Has curved arches above the windows, hand-hewn stone columns, a very beautiful building. And the nice part of it is, as a businessman standpoint, Ray probably got that square footage for less than two-thirds of the cost that he could have built a new building. But I think even more important, he saved almost 100 years of personality. And so what we're saying is, don't try to change the personality of the building. If you're going to have historical integrity, you're talking about maintaining that building's personality.
Don't destroy it. Don't make a Disneyland out of it. Look at the building, keep its character, but make it functional in today's society so that you can make money on your building. People don't realize how little it takes to make a storefront attractive in a Main Street context. It may be just a paint job or a minor alteration. I've seen case after case in which a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars made the difference between a typical leftover looking storefront and a storefront that reflected the character of the building and that met the needs of the merchant. More people need to know how easy it is to do and how they can do it. And one of the ways they can do it is to make themselves aware of the availability of design talent that is interested in design and can provide the needed guidance. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money and it isn't a big and dangerous thing to do. I think you've got to have the profession. They have a background in restoration. They know what they're talking about. They can sell the individual merchant on the fact of what can happen. That's important. I can't go up and down the street and uh, just because I've done something here uh, sell someone else the idea that this is good. It has to be done by a person that stands aside and, and has the, the depth and the background and the professionalism to do the job, I think. And it's building on itself and everyone is going to do it. They'll see the value of it. You know, you put your money into a store like this or into a building on Market Street and you're going to get a lot more than you do out of the stock market. I can't seem to articulate very well why this historic preservation stuff seems important for Main Street revitalization. As a matter of fact, I'm an ex-banker, and I'm even embarrassed using words like uh, building fabric or streetscape or stuff like that. But there's something significant there. Main Street revitalization projects seem to attract people. People want to be there. I can't think of any examples of uh, areas that did attempt a good historic preservation effort that did not pay off economically. I guess it will take planners to explain the words and the concepts. Uh, all I know is it does seem to pay off in dollars and cents. If we're going to make it work, it's from now on until the town dies. I'll give you an example. I'm a native of Iowa. I came here in 1945. But everything that means anything to me in life in this community, someone else built for me. The church that I was married in, the hospital my daughter was born in, the school building she was educated in, the house that I live in, the business building that I make my money and my life from, all were built by a former generation. Somebody else built it for me. And if we're really living up to the integrity of a society that is worth the name, and what we're really talking about is the continuity of preserving our past and building the future. And it's an exciting thing to realize that if we fulfill our commitment that 100 years from now, perhaps somebody else can say the same thing that I have, that we've preserved and built something that made their life worthwhile too.